Yeah, so thanks, Sarah, for being here Thank today. Uh, really excited to be here to talk with you about recruiting at scale. Um, do you just want to introduce yourself briefly to the persons in the audience? Just the small, the small little room, yeah. Um, <laughs> hi, I'm Sarah Manning. I lead the people team at Hopin. Um, I hope I live up to the introduction um, where, where, where he said that I, I do this well. I try to do this well, but I think that's what we <laughs> do every day. So um, I do lead the people team at Hopin. We, our mission at Hopin is to try and um, make the world feel closer through um, events like this, running in-person events, online events, virtual events, um, and building a platform that supports uh, making, making the world feel closer. So my team then, yes, we have scaled from um, a small handful at the beginning of 2020 to now uh, close to a thousand people, um, which, which, which um, is, it causes me a bit of anxiety <laughs> when I think of what we have done and, and reflecting on like how we, how we did it and, and where we're going. But it's also been um, an amazing journey. Yeah. Thanks. So nice to have you. Um, let's jump into the questions. Sure. So uh, in Hoffman's case, I heard that your founder and CEO, Johnny, he hired the first 50 employees himself. So that's quite a feat. Um, do you want to kind of explain what your recruitment process looked like in the beginning? And then do you think that that like, level of founder involvement is like necessary? Sure. So, so yeah, I mean, it's true. So, so Johnny Bufarat, our uh, founder and CEO at Hoffman, he was and still is very passionate about the team that we're hiring and, and uh, the, the people that are joining. So in the beginning, yeah, it was, it was just him, you know, so we had, he got his fir first, um, first investment and realized he, he had money to hire a team and um, he had built like the early, very early stage of the product himself, um, but, but needed to hire in particular, as, as many of you will know, like he wanted other engineers, he needed developers to help him build and scale and, and, and deliver what he needed. So he genuinely, like when I ask him, you know, it may, like it's not being a, like a people professional. It is not the the how you would do it if if you had a larger company. But actually, it was, it's what worked. And he he went out and literally went on to LinkedIn. He would contact people um, potentially on a Friday um, and and have them start on a Monday. Like it was it was that scrappy. Um, but he did. And and his like for me. The reason it's so important for a founder to be there and involved at those first, I mean, up to that first 50 hires, he's, he's still continued to be, to, be, to be involved, but him doing that personal recruiting, because at that scale, you don't have, you, you don't have a brand yet. So if you're, if you're and from my side of, side of the world, an employer brand, there's so many employer brands out there that you're competing with, that he was competing with, um, that, that what, what's, what was different? What was the sell? Why join Hopin over, you know, an, either a more established startup or a better brand that has maybe a better compensation package or different things? But what the reason that, that I've discovered and that I know from speaking to him and far, from those first 50 employees who joined, it was his passion. Nobody, as much as I can try to sell the vision and mission of Hopin, and I, I hope I do my best, but a founder, the, some, like the person whose dream, it's their baby. There is, there is something, I don't know, like contagious about it that there, to sell that vision, the best person to do it is a founder. So when you're trying to poach somebody from a, like a good job where they have benefits and they, they have a secure income and it's a brand that their family know, it's, it's hard to get them to join your company, to join your startup, but it is, it is, it is priceless to have a founder involved who can sell that ambition, that vision, and get the buy-in and trust and belief in where they want to go. That is the best way to hire, especially in the early, st in the, in the early days. Yeah, that's definitely true. Um, if you think about how you hired in the beginning, what would you have done differently looking back now? Um, I think, you know what, there's, I, I don't think we'd have done you know, I could say from like a process point of view, I wish we had better documentation. <laughs> I wish we knew who all those people were that he reached out to that I have no, no idea because we weren't tracking it. So I do think one of the, the and I know money, money can be tied in startups, but investing in, 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 a, in a, even in a basic ATS, so um, it, like a, a talent attraction tool, because it does allow you to keep track of who's talking to who, because when he then started, we then started, you know, those first 50 people and even until, until now, you know what, I think in, in a lot of companies they say everybody's always selling, but in startup, everyone's recruiting. So it was definitely one of our tactics whereby Johnny did say, and I think it was something you were going to ask, um, when, we, when someone did come on board and we did convince them to come in and, and join the hop-in journey, we did ask, 
who are the best people that you know? Like, who are the other best people that you know? Um, because we'll convince them. And I remember like talking to Johnny about this and people saying, oh, but what do you need? What, what's the skill that you're looking for? And he's like, we need it all. Like with, with where the vision he had and thankfully the investment that we had, we knew we needed to build a company. We needed to com build a company that was sustainable and that was grow, that would grow with us and have build that infrastructure. So it, it was, it was, it's, it's quite funny because it was like, just who were the best people? Who did you love working with? Who did you, who would you love to work with again? I don't care what they did because so long as they can, they want to come in here. Whether it's like, uh, you know, were they in marketing or sales or they were in engineering? It doesn't matter because we're building something brilliant and we want brilliant people on the journey. Um, so I think, but to go back to your question, what would <laughs> we've done differently is is some form of being able to track that some form of when everybody then is going out you've got a ton of people talking to people and we've we had no way internally of tracking it so I know certainly my head of recruiting now would say that was because I asked her before <laughs> before I came and she said oh dear god please just like track it whether it's documenting who you're talking to um, or investing in and like we use greenhouse as an ATS now we brought that in only we brought that actually it's probably in about a year so we brought that in probably within our first year um, and it was one of the best investments that that we made but it doesn't like that it is like an enterprise level level system but there are others out there but it is about being able to track who you're talking to so that you do protect because you are starting to grow your employer brand and you need to protect that brand and you don't want to look sloppy and scrappy by lots of different people reaching out to the same person and um, you still want to look like this is a real company and we know what we're doing yeah Awesome. Um, yeah, you said you, you have Greenhouse as your ATS. Um, what else has changed? You know, how do you do your recruiting now? I know you recruited like 50 people a month in the beginning of the year. So what's your process like? How do you manage that? Yeah, it's, it's, been, it's been interesting because we've, we, we don't want to lose be moving fast. And that is one thing. Gosh, if Johnny says to me, like if he doesn't say to me 10 times a day, yes, we need to focus on building the infrastructure and we want it to be sustainable, but we can't lose momentum. We can't lose momentum in the speed because of the market opportunity that's there and available right now. Um, so we, we, but we do need to bring in, so that's where he and I have good debates because I think of things like compliance and I think of um, things like, you know, it is like documentation because we are now a much bigger company. Um, so our, but what we're trying not to, so we, we compromise, so we try not to have a big lengthy process. It does depend on the roles and the jobs, but right now, so our Johnny is not central in our recruiting anymore. Um, we have recruiters, so every, every role has a designated recruiter. Um, that, that is key, so having one person in charge of the entire process, making sure there aren't multiple different points of contact reaching out, making sure the candidate experience is top priority, um, and understanding that, Someone will choose, even if they've, you're selling the company, like, it's really interesting. When you're in a candidate's shoes, you don't always see it that way. But for, from a business's perspective, you want to attract the best talent into you. A lot of, they're judging you though. They are judging you on that experience on every single person that they meet. But also, like, what's the gap? Like, or did you leave them waiting two weeks with no contact? They're going to go somewhere else. So it's being really mindful of that process. So I think that's the main difference is, is not, we haven't, what well, we've definitely lengthened it from, call on a Friday, start on Monday. <laughs> that has gone. But, but to try and do it within a few weeks from, from kind of getting your, your short list of, of your preferred candidates, getting them to meet internal people. Having um, what we call a hiring guide is really key at the beginning. So that's just a, maybe a, 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 a tool tip more so, like a technique that we would have once the recruiter is assigned the role now, they need to sit with the hiring manager or if there's going to be, if, depending on who the decision maker is, work with that person on what is a what is it that we're looking for? What are the questions we're going to ask? What's the process? Like, what is the process we're going to follow? Is it going to be like a quick two-step process? Are we going to do some type of like tech test? Determining what the process is at the beginning so that you are consistent. You can explain that to the candidate. They know what to expect. And then you're consistent with everybody else. So you're fair also. Um, and you're not changing process in between. So agreeing what your hiring guide is and then still trying to work through that stages. Don't leave candidates waiting. Respond as quickly as possible and reach your decision informed but as quickly as possible. Yeah, thanks. Uh, I think that's great advice for everyone in the audience. Um, we already kind of touched upon this, but if you think about then how to get good candidates, so I guess a common piece of advice is that people you know from before uh, really are the best ones to hire. Um, so how do you get, hop in, like source brilliant candidates, especially at a scale? Do you use your current employees' networks for that? Yeah, so like, like I said, at the beginning, it was definitely Johnny saying, tell me who the other brilliant people are. And we've kind of kept that philosophy. Um, 
I, I'll, I'll caution it in a moment, but generally, yeah, like, like right now, we are, I, I say it laughing because we're still so young, but we are more sophisticated. Um, so we have a referral program. We, um, so for any internal employee, because they are now, we need everybody selling, because we are still, we still have a lot of hiring to do, and we still have huge ambitions. So we want, if, if we've hired someone who's passionate and loves working with the company, like, let us know who else is good in your network. So we do have a now, like, we are incentivizing that financially. Um, so we do have a good uh, referral fro program in place. And I think we probably get, I'd say over 40% of our new hires now coming in are all through, can through uh, referrals. If not even higher, actually, I think it's probably close to 50% um, are referrals from our current team. The one caution that I have for anybody who's not so word distributed, so our team, the team that we have today that's over 900, we're across 47 different countries. So we are fully remote, we have no offices, we have no headquarters. What, what being in 47 different countries, when you do a referral program enables, it enables differences, it enables diversity. If you have your whole team coming from the same school, coming from all based in the same city, and you do a deep referral program, you're gonna get more of the same. So it's definitely a caution I would put out there. Referrals are amazing because you've worked with great people before, and if you know they will fit with a company, that helps you run fast. Um, but it is a pitfall if you're hiring from the same pool consistently. We're, we're lucky in that when we put in our referrals, we were already, we've been very distributed from the very beginning. Um, so when we refer now, we're thankfully getting referrals across multiple different countries, multiple different backgrounds. So we're getting multiple different perspectives. Um, so yeah, referrals definitely work for us. Yeah, super. That's really valuable. Um, what do you look for in a candidate? Like what are top, top things you look for? Um, number one, for, for bespoke to us, and, and I, think, I think for many, like if, if your founders here, um, agility. Agility, number one. Being able to be flexible, being able to deal with ambiguity, being able to move fast are key. So when we, we do it now, but that was what we looked for in our early joiners. So the early joiners who joined a year ago. <laughs> um, that's what we were looking for because they knew. They, you, do, you have a, a perception of what startup is, but it is good to articulate it. It is good to articulate that you do need people who who are okay if their job like if their their job might change in the next few months what you're hired to do today if you're working in startup and a fast paced startup that things are going to change you need to be able to flex with what the company is doing it is going to be ambiguous things will change like for us the different levels of investment you get will change what may change what you're focused on you might be able to acquire another company you might be able to do different things invest in a different product those things, if you have a core team working with you, for them to be able to roll with that and not just be tunnel vision on, oh, but when I joined, we were just doing this and I thought this was the sole thing we were here to do and that I was here to do, that person is probably not gonna scale with you. So I think how you do that is being transparent as early as possible, being as transparent with, your, with those candidates you're interviewing, um, in interview stage and in like that onboarding stage, making sure they understand what they're getting into um, is really important. I think additional to us in, in, in with agility um, is, is understanding what it means to be remote. So understanding what it means not to come into an office every day, not to have your team right beside you um, is something that we're, we're quite clear about. So obviously with what we do, we try to, to, if we're here to try and bring people closer in the world, <laughs> I'd be kind of failing in my job if I wasn't able to bring our employees uh, close in the same way. So we are very purposeful about how we bring our team together and how we connect and engage being remote. But, but yeah, it is something that is important for us to articulate and have people understand what working in a fully remote environment means versus, and what it, what it is and what it isn't. Yeah, definitely. Um, just quickly, after you hire these brilliant people, what does your onboarding look like? Yeah, so, so like, uh, it's, a, it's a good follow-on question. So one of the things that I had to unlearn was coming from like a, a, a background where we did pre-COVID, everything, you know, if we were doing onboarding in EMEA, everybody came to Dublin, or if you're, you know, depending on where your office is, you typically brought people to your office. So a lot of companies had to obviously rethink that when, when the pandemic hit and we had to do onboarding remotely. That was such a beautiful gift when I joined Hopin because that's, that was the purpose. We, we, it wasn't as if the team were trying to reconfigure how you do onboarding because uh, I think what a lot of companies got stuck in was figuring out okay this is what our onboarding was when we were in office how do we make this work which is different to we're remote we're starting from scratch 
what does that mean for how we onboard people? Um, and thankfully, when, when I came in, there was already um, a couple of folks in the people apps team that, that I took on who had already thought about it. Who, they had come into a fully remote company and they had designed actually what will work what like and and we do use like so it's it's easy for me to say because it's easy for us to use hop in so we actually put on an event so we would run a virtual online event we call it our academy it's a five to, it's the event itself takes place over five days, but we prep people it's as if it's like you coming here today we reach out in advance we let we obviously send people logistics is really important so um, the last thing you want is for someone on their first day because they're not physically for us going to an office and um, they're staying possibly still in their bedroom um, making sure they have the equipment they need making sure they have a laptop making sure you've given them understanding what setup they need and are supplying that setup for them in 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 their homes but at a minimum like that's us being more sophisticated now looking at office setup a minimum you have to get them a laptop they have to be able to work to get onto your systems to be able to access what you're doing. Um, so we communicate early on. So from, we have a really good now handover from the recruiter onto somebody on, on our um, onboarding team, on the people ops team, who then holds their hand, the, our new hires, through what to expect on your first day, making sure they get their equipment, making sure they know <laughs> not physically where to be, but online where to be. And where they are is in, in an onboarding event. So we created this event um, called our Academy. Um, people on your first day, and it's a mix. It's, it's, if you picture this online, so there's going to be an expo area. Within the expo area, we have tons of resources for people. So we'll have a video from our founder welcoming them. We'll have a video about our values. We'll have video links to product training. So for any like, eager folks who, who sign up, who, who, who joined the event before start time, um, they can go in and just start having a look around. And then across the week, it's a mix of um, sync and async, because I think that's the way people are, are receiving and learning more in, in, in this new way of working. So we would have mixed, like, in-person, like, intros to, hey, these are all the other new joiners hire, being hired, this is your cohort, to different facilitated trainings, such as product training, training on our sales process, training on how finance works at Hopin. So we'd have all facilitated training, um, and then a lot, a lot of self-directed. So we would have links then to some self-directed reading, self-directed training over, over the course of that week. And I know that sounds probably like a lot, but it wasn't. That was done before I joined. I was employee around 250. So that was done way before I even started. So that was just a team of not HR people. That was just a group of people going, okay, how can we onboard? Now we've evolved it since and we've become more sophisticated. But at the beginning it was okay. We like literally, okay, let's get in a, a virtual event. Let's just load it with some content. Who are the people who know? Who can facilitate? Who knows about products? Let's get one of our product managers in to talk to the new hires. It doesn't have to be complicated. With the volume we do, it's, it's definitely a more sophisticated machine that we run, but it doesn't have to be uh, difficult or overwhelming to, to set something up just to be purposeful about how you onboard. Yeah, awesome. Um, yeah, you just said, you know, Hopin is a fully remote company. You're distributed across 47 countries, was yeah. it? Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's quite a lot. Um, but you've been that from the beginning, so you're kind of the experts on remote hiring, I'd say. <laughs> So um, what do you think other companies should take into account when hiring remotely? Like, what are your main tips for that? I, I think I've, I've probably touched on some of this. I think if you are hiring, and I, I don't know if we're experts, we're, we're still so young, we're totally learning, and I am unlearning a lot of what I've done before to try and look through. So I think probably to answer your question, one thing is to look at what you do through a remote lens. So understanding everything, like how, how, can, how will somebody now submit an expense, and there's obviously great tools out there for that now, through to engaging, meeting their team, how much are you going to do that is sync versus async? How much, like, as we've all been through it, like, you, like dying at the end of the day because you've just been on back-to-back -back video calls, how much can you do now in different ways of communicating? So I think probably it's being purposeful in how you connect with your team, understanding and, and thinking through how you communicate, um, why and when you communicate. And, and like we have little things like meeting etiquette. We, we really try not to have a meeting longer than 30 minutes. Um, we have 50, like 15 minute check-ins are, are really common because it helps you just get to, get to like what is the purpose of the meeting and anything that is shorter than that should be like we will record videos now. So it's, I feel I'm a bit old <laughs> that I, I'm, my team are all doing it regularly. So instead of like, hey, can you jump on a call? They're sending me like a quick Loom video or a StreamYard video like that they've just recorded themselves. That's like a five minute update on something. So I think being aware of how people consume 
information, how people connect. There's multiple ways of doing it. So, so again, one of our tools, um, you, need to invent, you need to figure out what, how are you talking, like the, the regular talking. So we use Slack and we don't, like I would say, I think less than 1% of my email is internal. So there's, internally, we and it's something I need to remember because I rarely check my email anymore. Um, but, but it is, obviously we do have like different external people reaching out and customers and stuff that we need to obviously stay on top of email. But, but Slack internally for us is, is our main means of communication instantly. Um, but then, yeah, combining it with um, different etiquette around video, um, face-to-face -face meetings. I think one thing for us as well with regard to how we maintain connection with, with a remote team is having a cadence where people can know what's happening. So one thing, it's similar to like our, our thought process in setting up the, the academy was um, our team all hands meeting or some companies call them town halls. It's where you bring your whole company and that's a company of 10 or for us it's a company of 900 plus people together. That for me was something that I realized had to be different in a remote environment. When you all sit together, you know, in the same office, you're talking so regularly, you've maintained, you have that connection, you, you've, you've, you understand, you should understand what is happening, what someone else is working on. When you're so distributed, and even it doesn't have to be distributed like us across 40 plus countries, when you're simply just not in the same office together or not necessarily in the same time zone together, you do miss just knowing what, what's, what's happening with somebody or what's happening in a particular team. So we do um, what we call our weekly all hands. Again, we run it like an event. So that was something for me. I came from, you know, looking at town halls or all hands as information receiving. That, yeah, the CEO or some leader is going to join and tell me what, they're, what we're working on and that's going to be good and that's helpful for me but it was never interactive. It was, it was not something where, but yes, there might be a Q&A at the end, but it wasn't something necessarily that was really um, engaging. Like, whereas what we do now, when you, when you think about it differently in a remote setting, we treat it now like a show. And again, I know it's, it sounds like um, high production, but it's not. Like, we simply have, like, we have a couple of hosts, they're, they're hopping employees. We sometimes alternate the hosts. We do it for 30 minutes once a week. Um, Johnny, our, our founder CEO, always joins top, but we start it with music. Like, we, we just do things a little bit differently. It is not just a, a meeting whereby people are here to listen. We want to hear from the team, we want to engage. So we have our chat feature running throughout it, which is ridiculously on fire <laughs> throughout the whole thing. Um, we have the, the, um, our founder talk, and we'll, do, we'll bring on like customer spotlights. We will talk deeply about you know, what, what our focus is this week, this month, this quarter, um, but it's really engaging. Um, and that's, I, I think that's one of the things, it, it's, it's a similar um, tool in terms of, okay, we need to have like some type of all hands or town hall to communicate, but it's how you do it and how do you do it in a way that keeps your team staying on for the full hour um, and actually engaging within it, engaging in the chat, asking questions, participating in polls. There's different ways to, to do it. Yeah, I yeah, definitely relate to the chat feature when we have our uh, all hands meetings as well. Um, when they were remote, um, the chat was always on fire, everyone writing things. And I think that's a good thing because when you have a live meeting, it's, you can't like interrupt the person who's speaking like that. Yeah, so I think yeah. that's one of the very good features of you know, being remote is that you can just like have a separate side chat where you write things. Yeah, uh, I think it's really fun. But yeah, we're nearing the end of our stage time. So um, I just want to ask, what are your like key learnings from your journey at Hopin? Um, what are the Wait. like most important things you want to share with everyone in the audience? Um, I think that for a founder, have being willing to go out and hire the team. Like to me, that was we, be, being open maybe to different ways of working. We were open to hiring anybody anywhere. Um, that certainly helped us not be restricted. So if we were just picking one particular city or two cities to target, we would never have scaled as fast as we did. It just wouldn't have been possible. So when you can like cast your net literally worldwide the way we did, you will find amazing talent in the less obvious areas. Um, so I think being, being willing to, to do things differently, I think was super important for us. And then that coupled with as a founder, being able to articulate your vision, being able to sell passionately what you were building, why somebody should leave their steady job or that other funky startup that they're working with to come join you, have that story ready because that is what will grab people. That is what will bring them. And then once you bring them, they bring more. Um, and I think lastly, like I touched on it before, but 
agility in the team, having hiring people who will be flexible. Who, and it's hard to predict it, so I think the only way you can get around that is just being, being as transparent as possible that, hey, this is startup, like this is, we, like who knows what, what ebbs and flows we're gonna have on this journey. Everything is not gonna be crystal clear, straight up, at, like a, a clean line to where we're going being able to articulate that to somebody so that they're, they're okay with it and they realize, okay, yeah, I can do this. I can be agile. I, I can flow with, um, with where this journey is going to go. Because the, the, the last thing you want is hiring somebody great and they do a really great job, but then they become a blocker because they're not able to flex and move with where the company's going. Yes. Awesome. Thank you so much, uh, Sarah, for coming here today. And thank you for sharing, sharing your insights. It's been great my to pleasure, have you. My pleasure. My pleasure. Enjoy the rest of the event, everyone.